Okay, so I do have a confession to make. I am a developer, right? And as a developer, I really love making analogies. And one analogy I found that works with state comes from physics, and it's you have ice, which transitions by melting into water, and then transitions through evaporation into steam. And this is very peaceful, it works as intended. However, as a developer, I'm also really bad at applying these analogies in practice. And hopefully none of you are writing uh, re nuclear reactor code in JavaScript. But we should not take our ourselves too seriously. And that's why I figured I'd start my talk with a joke. And it kind of goes like this. A thunk, a saga, and an epic walk into a bar. And the bartender asks, what's the state of affairs? And this is funny because it's true. Uh, the way we solve problems uh, when we have too much state, we just add more state to it. Um, well, it might seem like it's fine, but in reality, it's not really. My name is Arthur. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at that handle. And I work for an elderly care startup in London. And w what we aim to do is basically build a platform that helps you care uh, for your loved ones in a less intrusive and more inclusive manner as they grow older. And we are Birdie. And that's my team. Before we begin, I would like to uh, state some foolish assumptions I have made about my audience, and namely that uh, you know a little bit about React, you know a little bit about Redux, because I will be using some terms uh, quite often, and if you don't, don't worry, still the animations are fun, slides, I worked on them, and they will be available online after the, my talk. Uh, so that you can refer back to them and look for the terms that you don't understand. In latest years, uh, so I think that would be like last two, um, state management in React has become synonymous with Redux. And whenever you see that logo, basically you see it refers to Redux. And there are multiple ways you can manage state in your React application. The first one, and most obvious, would be to uh, think of it as where it is stored in your client-side application. And in that particular uh, categories, you would have your internal state, which is inside the component. It's internal to that single component, and you have access to it through the state object, and you can change that state object through the setState method. And then you will have a state that's being passed on from the parent to the child through props. There's a new one uh, which has become stable uh, for a few months now, uh, and it's the context API. And then there's the daddy of them all, which is Redux. And basically, you use connect to map your component state to um, the Redux store state. However, uh, as your applications grow la larger, uh, you will find yourself uh, in trouble just managing state through those four categories. So basically, you will want to have something that's more semantically relevant to your application. And uh, my recommendation in this case would be that you uh, store state uh, by what it's meant to do. And basically, in this, uh, I managed to kind of figure out say five categories, and those are data, uh, communication, control, session, and location. The data part of your state will be the state that knows about the outside world. Say you have uh, an accounts management system. Basically, a list of accounts that you maintain on your client side would be a uh, piece of uh, data state category, and that would fall into the data state category, for example. For the communication state, you want to keep track of all that, the communication that's ongoing. So for example, uh, requests that have started and are pending and are ongoing, if you have a long request, say that you're doing an ETL, for example. Uh, that would be like, if it fails, that would be stored in a communication state uh, 
category. The control state is something that deals with what your user is doing currently on your application, and it has not been pushed to the server yet. Basically, it's like forms, you checked like a combo box or a tech, uh, tech box or anything like that. Uh, the session state identifies the user uh, uniquely. It's like a uh, user ID, you have a, maybe a token, I don't know, uh, maybe some preferences that you keep on your client side. And then above all of these, there's a location state. And I say above all these because the location state actually loads and unloads other parts of the, uh, the states, uh, the ca categories I've just mentioned. But we're here to talk about side effects. And side effects are a small part, uh, yet very complex, of the uh, state management in your React application because you don't want it all over the place. Usually you'll want it in a middleware. Uh, middleware in React is pretty much like uh, the normal concept of a middleware in other, any other programming languages, but it sits in between the action creator uh, so React has action creators that you uh, cr create actions with and uh, send them to the store to mutate the state. And in between those two sits the middleware. So basically you could do like API calls in that uh, middle ground. Uh, a normal flow for any kind of middleware would be like it captures the current state and then uh, the action uh, is uh, payload is pushed to the next middleware in the chain and all the way down until it reaches the Redux uh, store and then it will get mapped to a reducer and mutate the state. And this is what it looks like in practice. This is the most common example of a middleware you will ever find. So basically this is the logger middleware. If you Google for middleware, this is the first guy you'll find. Initially, you want to inject the ability to get your current state. And as we do want to uh, chain and compose multiple uh, middlewares, we want to return a callable so that it's composable with the next ones. And now, because it's a logger, we ideally would like to get the current state, uh, mutate it, uh, and log the current state the action that triggered the mutation, and then the resulting state. And here we get essentially the current and the next state. And then we log them. However, remember, for composability, we need to return the resulting state so that it's passed on to the next middlewares. However, Redux, in essence, is not, synchronous, is not asynchronous. So the interesting part uh, is what happens when you want to handle asynchronous actions because uh, requests are asynchronous by nature, uh, basically Ajax. So these were, this is where Thunks, Sagas, and Epics come in. They're all middlewares, and they get, all get applied in that uh, no man's land between the action creator and the store in order to be able to uh, wait for the payload to be resolved. So basically, wait for the request to complete. Initially, I started working with tongues, right? Because they're very uh, kind of the, you can pick them up straight away because that's the first thing you find when you look for asynchronous operations in your middleware. And thunks are uh, basically a, f a concept from functional programming. Um, I think it's also called currying. Essentially, it, you build your workload uh, up until you are ready to call your function. And then uh, when you need to call it, you just do it. Uh, a normal function is not lazy. It's not like a thunk. It's basically when you call it, it will get called then and it will do what you tell it to. So this is a normal function and it's very complex. Uh, it basically says hello. Uh, 
And this is the thunk version of the same thing. Because in this case, you would return a callable instead of the actual function. And you would build up the parameters that you want to pass into that callable. And then you construct it with your parameter. And then you call it. And it's as simple as that. However, my preference is for fat arrows. Um, it's, yet, it's way past 2015. ES6 exists. So yeah, why not? So uh, the thunks are lazily evaluated. And it gives you a great advantage because they're highly composable. And you can also implement lazy evaluation in JavaScript using other methods. Uh, those are just a few. However, we haven't yet injected it uh, into the Redux store. Um, and basically, what, what we want to, how we want to do that is through the uh, Thunk middleware. It used to be part of uh, Redux, but it's been pulled out because there are better ways to do things. But I'll tell you all about that. Whoa. And uh, OK, so thunks allow us to uh, keep all our uh, impure actions in the middlewares rather than having actions that work synchronously and asynchronously. And basically, that would give us the complexity of having to look for when uh, something goes wrong, we don't know where to look exactly because it might be either in an action creator or uh, the middleware, but we don't really know. And basically, gives you better debugability. A simple, uh, when I first started, I thought, OK, so I'll just put my thunks in there and then return the promise to the Redux store. Everything will work fine. And I would just, oh, I would just do a fetch and pull the user in and then just use it in my Redux store just by returning it in a dispatch. However, that's not quite right because uh, given that it's asynchronous, uh, the middleware did not intercept that call. And basically, the, what wound up in the Redux store was a promise. And the Redux store is synchronous and doesn't know what to do with it. We could uh, maybe just uh, in that uh, second then clause, maybe dispatch the action there. So the user is resolved at that point. However, that gives us an inconsistent API because some actions will have stored dispatches and some won't. And basically, again, that will create impure actions. It will work, but it's not uh, good. And it will be tightly coupled to the store because you would be directly calling actions to the store. And the preferred way you would do uh, thunk dispatches would be by injecting the dispatch function into the thunk and then uh, calling the store dispatch with that thunk. So essentially, you see like the lazy evaluation of the function. You build up the payload, and then you pass it on to the store. And this will be handled in the middleware, in the thunk middleware. And this is pretty much it. Uh, basically, you now have all the tools uh, that you would require to build asynchronous, handle asynchronous requests. Um, and I was really happy back then when I only knew about these, uh, because basically I could do all my side effects, right? Uh, I didn't need to use anything else. And uh, you can chain everything over and over again with dance. Promises are fun. Um, however, it's not, it's not the end of the story, because then I, met, I, I got to a little bit to read about sagas, and my mind kind of uh, all over the place, because they're really fun to use. Uh, they, are, uh, it, it, they change your code a lot, and it makes it more testable, more modular, 
And when something goes wrong, you know exactly where to look. And yeah, that's great in my opinion. So sagas are again a middleware library for Redux. And basically their uh, goal is to make all your side effects management uh, nicer. It, makes, uh, it wants to make it easier and less of a pain to handle because um, with thunks, you eventually will wind up in the place where you do have callbacks everywhere. Well, depending on the request library you use, if, whether it returns promises or callbacks, but you know, promises are like more or less like callbacks in disguise. So the code will not look pretty if you have a lot of uh, error handling on your request to, requests to do. And this is what the saga would look like when you do a couple of requests. And it's very uh, intuitive because it's more or less like uh, error handling in just synchronous programming. Have a bunch of your actions, uh, which you, you want to handle and dispatch. And then um, you yield a call, which means that the data will be resolved once it reaches the put line. And basically, that what means what uh, this tells me is that uh, I got the data from the API, and once I got the data, I would uh, dispatch a success action. However, you know, error uh, is also uh, okay. So when doing requests, you will always have errors. There's no point in you know being optimistic. So why not have an error as well? Now, the other interesting thing about sagas is that you also need and require to have a watcher saga that kind of listens to all the actions that are being currently dispatched, and you will have a handler to uh, uh, work, to do work when that action happens. But yeah, like I said, you could, could still use tongues. Uh, the previous example was very simple. Uh, you could have well, maybe one error when uh, something goes wrong on the fetch data from the API. And one error, that's a catch. So then catch, and yeah, that's fine. Using tongues, that's a lot of fun. But with sagas, you have more of a kind of intuitive uh, flow to it. So you have a try block where you just execute all your requests, and then you have a catch block where uh, you can handle your errors. And you can handle one or multiple errors, depending. You can like uh, manage status codes from the API and send them back, and you would know how to handle specific errors. Now, for a little background on how I started with sagas. Basically, I googled what saga meant initially, and I wound up on all Lord of the Ring websites and all that stuff. But the thing is that I found that sagas are actually a pattern, uh, and it's very useful in microservices. And basically, it allows you to handle uh, reverts of uh, already executed actions in a smarter way. So basically when you don't have the luxury of a database atomicity, you could use a saga to kind of have a smart way of going back after you actually did all the nasty things. So imagine like uh, you are building a, an API that goes to a bunch of third party services and makes a kind of booking, but it uses multiple APIs, right? So you book your trip, and you pay, and you book, book a room, and you pay for that as well, and you try to book a flight, and the flight booking fails. However, you pay for the room, you paid for the trip as, uh, already, and maybe you had a coupon for it, and basically you had a you know discount or something like that. 
And what you would do if you had atomicity, basically you'd revert the whole thing. Uh, the person would lose their discount, their uh, coupon, or something like that. Okay, I'm uh, devil's advocating, advocating right now because mm, it's a kind of a corner case, but it could happen, and basically atomicity is what would cause you to lose the client, to be honest. So what if you instead uh, suggested a way to do this better in that suggest send an email to the customer and tell them, okay, you could uh, potentially look at a different flight or you could do something else that you know kind of keeps and actually engages the customer more. I don't know. And this is all I've learned from a talk from Katie McCaffrey. I would recommend that you go watch her talk. Even It's not about Redux, it's language agnostic. Uh, it's on YouTube at that link. And yeah, it's, uh, basically that's how I learned that sagas are not ju just JavaScript. However, in JavaScript, they are implemented using generators. And generators are functions that can be uh, paused or resumed from outside. And they have uh, two functions that trigger uh, their you know, execution or uh, exit. So it's next and throw. Next will uh, trigger, uh, execute the next step in my uh, generator, and throw will just uh, exit. And a JavaScript generator is something that's available with ES6 syntax. Uh, basically, it's a funny looking superstar notation. So it's a superstar function. And basically, it's again with the uh, reserved keyword yield. Basically, that means that in line number three is a place where the execution would stop once you put uh, once you trigger next on that generator. And you have a catch clause for uh, the case where you have a, an error being thrown. And you construct it. You do a next. Basically, um, you would uh, have a three there. Or you could just cause it to uh, crash and throw an error. But sagas are not just uh, those specific functions. There are a lot of other special effects. And basically, I'm just going to go uh, through a rundown of them. Um, and basically, you have fork, which allows you to do non-blocking operations. And basically, you execute it with a, a function. You have take, which uh, consumes actions. Race uh, will uh, kind of, it's basically what it sounds like. It would pit together two effects, and whoever comes out first wins. You have a call, which you saw earlier. When you do a call, yield call co construct, basically you would call a function and wait for the return. The put is used for dispatching actions. So basically, when I say actions here, I mean the Redux actions. So it's the same thing. Select will allow you to pluck things out of the Redux store. And basically, you see you have, let's say you have the user, um, and you just select uh, from the state of the store. You have access to a state and uh, just pull it out. The take latest is very similar to take. However, um, it will not execute everything. It will only uh, execute the latest uh, action that gets passed in. So basically, if you have uh, the store having dispatched uh, fetch user multiple times, only the last one will get mapped. So basically, if you have a pending fetch user, those will all get thrown away. And take every, takes everything. Uh, I don't know, it's like a pretty intuitive, I think, to me. OK, now for a little bit of code uh, in a more realistic example of a saga. So again, you see, uh, generator function, superstar notation, there you go. And you fetch your user, 
and then you want to store it in the state, of course. And then you will uh, dispatch uh, an action for the fetch user success if you are successful, or you know fetch failed. And then you have another saga that um, basically will consume that uh, user success fetch. And this is where you'd use the select. After you store the user in, the, in your state, basically you'd pluck the user out of the state and use it in a subsequent saga. And now you want to get, uh, this, is, this is a dashboard. It's a, like a dashboard that will display uh, flight information for a specific user. So you want to get the flight information and the uh, forecast for that specific uh, destination the user is trying to go to. OK, so you see the departure is used in the subsequent two calls. So basically here, the flight and the forecast are not really depending on one another. So I think the better way would be to try to do it in parallel. And this is how you do parallel uh, calls to the API, because you don't need them both. Uh, they're not dependent on one another. And then once everything is done, you want to uh, actually tell the client side application that everything's successful and everything should be rendered. OK, this is. Again, oh, sorry about that. And this is, uh, again, how you would inject, uh, use your sagas in your watcher saga. This is basically the watcher saga that kind of knows what's going on and hand uh, hooks uh, all your, the actions get, that get passed in to the other sagas that are running currently. And that's it for the saga part of it. But we also want to inject uh, our saga middleware into our Redux store. And the way we do that is we would create a saga middleware uh, through, you know, the uh, normally named create middle, saga middleware, which is, yeah, I don't know. Uh, where did they come up with these names? Basically, you uh, use that create saga middleware function that's available in the saga library, and then you inject your middleware in the uh, Redux store. And after that, you just run it. It's fine. It's going to work, and you're done. The key takeaways from sagas is, are um, basically uh, whenever you want to dispatch an action, use put. Right? It's easy. Just give the action type put, and everything's fine. Uh, you want to uh, do your AJAX requests in um, yield call constructs. So basically, you do a yield call function of what I want to do from the API, what I pull, want to pull in from the API, and then attribute it to a variable, and that will be resolved before it gets passed on to the next line. Um, if you want to do things that don't really depend on one another, um, if you want to be optimal, I would do them uh, in parallel. So something like you know, just doing the multiple calls, yield, call, and the list. And I would advise that uh, you actually use the fact that it's as simple as writing a catch clause to handle your errors, because it, it's never worth to be cautious. It's never bad to be cautious, sorry. But yeah, I, w I felt pre pretty confident. I knew what sagas were, and I thought, ah, yeah, this is it. All I need to know. Um, and then I heard this really great talk 
from uh, Jay Phelps at Netflix about epics. I was like, what? <laughs> Basically, uh, epics are again, uh, like I said, another middleware. <laughs> but they're based off, um, um, the, the, okay, so Redux Observable uh, is the middleware, and then epics are the primitive for that uh, middleware. And basically, uh, it's kind of a wrapper around RxJS and um, all that observable niceness it gives. And basically, you can transform your actions into observable streams and then react to them as they um, come into the Redux store. And like I said, middleware, they sit in between the uh, action and the store. So basically, you can think of it as like a pipe, and actions go in, and they <coughs> mutate the state after they come out. Are, um, is anyone here familiar with RxJS at all? No? Rx? Okay. Okay. So basically what uh, Redux Observable does, it gives you the benefits of being able to do, uh, to use reactive programming uh, for composing your actions and uh, sending them to the uh, store once they're resolved. Um, I found that um, uh, Redux Observable gives you a much better way of canceling your uh, pending actions. And you also have the, you know, like the natural observable kind of unsubscription to that uh, stream of actions. However, uh, that's not recommended. Uh, and also, you have the way of composing it through uh, the operators the R that the RxJS library gives you. So uh, there's a bunch of them. There's zip co combined with. And yes, if uh, you're talking about Redux observables, first you want to talk about observables. And basically, you can build, um, build observables out of anything, pretty much. And here you have an example of an action, an array of actions. And basically, this is how you write a simple ticking um, dispatching action. And this is how you would cancel it using the observable method for unsubscribe. However, the recommended way to do it would be to filter out uh, with the take until. Uh, operator, so that once uh, the store gets the action to actually quit, stop ticking, well, uh, then it will stop. And I found those quite nice to reason about, uh, quite easy to reason about, because this, uh, if you've noticed, compared to sagas, this looks much more readable, because you have like a, okay, Dispatch, take until, t uh, tick, take until, stop, tick. Whoa, that's, that's readable, right? And it's not just me, I hope. Um, and then I had a look at some slightly more uh, asynchronous actions because the previous one was just a you know, toy example. So basically, we want to create, uh, we want to use the uh, stream of actions uh, to, to get the stream of actions passed in. And then we want to um, perform an AJAX request to fetch something from the API. And once that gets resolved, we want to uh, signal the client, well, we fetch, that's fine. All good, so the pay payload has been resolved. However, if that's a long running thing, again, you want to be able to cut it short. So if it gets cut short, the, the action will be canceled. And all of this 
will be prepended with a, a signal to the communication state that, okay, I have started fetching a user. So the fetch user uh, operation is pending, and this is something that would go in the communication, uh, communication category of your uh, Redux state that I was mentioning earlier. However, this is not uh, yet, this has not yet been injected into the Redux store. And the way you do that would be fairly similar to how we did it for the Saga middleware. Well, I, my feeling is that it looks a little bit like reducers and sagas kind of mashed together, but yeah, it's very, the concepts and the namings are very similar in both. Oh. So you would construct your root epic as you would have constructed your root saga previously. And then you would create an epic middleware and inject it into your store. And essentially that's it. Okay, now you might be thinking, okay, so it's sagas and epics, which should I use? But uh, the thing is, you could go for a versus comparison, right? I mean, that's the first thing that pops into mind. Um, I'm not a big fan of versus comparison when it comes to technology, because I feel like every technology is good as a, in its own right. Uh, and basically, we should celebrate the differences instead. But I will kind of have a play-by-play -play of what features each uh, offers. So when it comes to functionality, um, the Redux observable middleware and library will provide you with everything RxJS has to offer, right? It's very powerful with working with streams, um, and the uh, code you can write is really expressive. So basically you can actually read the code and make sense of what's happening most times. When it comes to usability, again, um, Redux Observable uh, has a lot of functionality from RxJS, but in terms of usability, that's not exactly an advantage because it means that you need to be somewhat uh, versed in how RxJS works as well. So basically you'd have more or less like three layers of complexity on top of JavaScript. And it's gonna be React Redux and then uh, RxJS and middlewares and side effects handling. And if you don't know how to use it properly, you mean, I mean RxJS, then you may find yourself in trouble. And sometimes some of the error reporting that you get when you actually do run into some trouble is not as uh, verbose as you would like it to be. And of course, testability, because everyone likes to write tests. Um, and it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to write tests. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but sometimes it's tiring, especially when you have to uh, come up with uh, magical solutions to write tests. Uh, and our ex um, Redux Observable suffers from this, because uh, Basically, uh, observables are streams, so, so they're never done. It's not like, uh, okay, I'm gonna do this step and this is gonna be done then. They're just a flow of continuous things coming through. And there is a way to test them, obviously, uh, but it took a bit of work. And again, another layer of complexity. But if you do have it, if you do know about it, feel free to use it. And sagas are a little bit ugly when testing because, like I said, um, 
when you run a saga, it's essentially a generator. So basically what you're going to do is saga next and test that that value is the value you expect it to be and then do another next. Again, test, again, another next, test. And that's ugly in my opinion. Me, I kind of prefer sagas. Uh, I've been working them with them for a year. Um, I find them obvious uh, for apparent reasons because I know I have been working with them. <laughs> um, however, when I read first about the uh, Redux obser Observable, um, I found it uh, really nice in the way that you could cancel actions really easily and the code was much more expressive. Um, and basically, you know, right about now, you may be thinking, well, we've been talking for a while now, and, uh, you know, if I'm trying to make up my mind what technology I should use, I don't really know, because they both have the plus, minuses, and advantages, disadvantages, drawbacks. The thing is that I realized is that when choosing a technology, you are not actually choosing a technology at all. At all. You shouldn't think, uh, you know, is this technology better? It's more about what your team can handle. So basically, you're not choosing a technology, your team is choosing a technology, and um, it's popular vote, after all. So if your team knows RxJS, go for that. If your team uh, is able to wrap their heads around reactive programming, I know I wasn't at first. I kind of think I have a handle on it, but you know, uh, then yeah, definitely. Uh, Redux observables are for you. And of course, maybe you're working on an open source project and you want something that will have contributors eventually, or something like that. And if they don't know, uh, if uh, the people, number of people that know uh, some library is greater than another, just go for the obvious choice. Okay, and um, that's it for me. You can find me on Twitter. I will post the link to these slides. Uh, they're written in React, so you can npm download, npm install, and npm start them. Or I will also post a uh, link to a static website that's uh, the bundle for this. Uh, so you can uh, you know, check them out, kind of uh, check out the, pick up more, uh, you know, if you don't know, follow up on the concept, and that's it. Stay classy. <laughs>